Um, friends, as we start, I, I just want to make a little addendum to Mike's announcement. Um, I, I don't want to raise expectations too high. Um, going on a mission trip does not mean that someone on the team will have a baby. I might neglect you to kind of make this, this detail. Rather, the family that we were serving had a child, had a, a baby, and brought the child home uh, while the team. Is that right, Tom? Okay, there were no miraculous. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tom. That's, that's, that's going to go on YouTube. There we go. Okay. Friends, uh, come back with me to 1996 in the spring. Vail, Colorado, 1996. It was April. I had just arrived the fall before as your young uh, assistant rector. Uh, I had been asked by a wonderful godly man, Father Bruce Moncrief, uh, to just take the Easter sunrise service with our Baptist colleague. Um, it's an early sunrise service. Bruce said, just go up the gondola, have a, a message, just a few minutes. It's a rather relaxed affair. So not knowing and not ever being up there, uh, I, I arrived early in the morning at the parking structure in Lion's Head. I started to notice a large amount of people that also were pulling up, ironically, at the same time. I noticed that some of the young men had boxes that they had cut uh, into cardboard, um, long rectangular shapes. And they were getting on to, remember the old gondola in the Lion's Head? Um, a, a brisk ride up the mountain. Then I noticed all the people with headlamps that were using the mountain. I was so impressed as their own personal stairmaster. They were climbing, they were coming up the mountain almost at the speed of the gondola. Um, it seemed like an awful lot of people heading up to what was a modest service. Well, I walked into that room and soiled my, myself. <laughs> 800 people gathered in April of 1996 for the Sunrise Easter service. If you've never been, please put it on your bucket list. It is a magnificent service. Bruce never told me. I was terrified. And so to gather my wits, because the Baptist pastor said, oh, you're the new priest, you preach. Great. <laughs> to gather myself, uh, I said at the beginning, let's everybody close your eyes and take a deep breath and let's reflect on the mystery of the resurrection together. 799 people closed their eyes. And there she was. She was about the fifth row back on the right side, sitting on the aisle. She was only two years old at that time. This is before my wife and I had had our daughter. A beautiful little two-year-old girl. She had her eyes wide open. She'd been promised by her daddy that she would see the sunrise uh, over the mountains, and she was not about to miss this for anything in the world. Everybody else had their eyes closed, their heads bowed, and here she is. The light, as the sun came over the mountains, caught her face. And I looked into these huge, beautiful hazel eyes. And Easter arrived for me in that moment. When we passed the peace later, she ran and threw her arms around me and gave me a two-year-old hug. You know the kind of unconditional hug that makes the world right. I mentioned her at the end of the service and thanked her. Her daddy and mom brought her to church the very next Sunday, and they've been members of our church since April of 1996. I had the privilege a year ago of watching that girl graduate from high school. We celebrated her right here on Senior Sunday. Um, she came back for the first time from college last weekend. And where did she go? She came here and brought her daddy to worship with you, with us, the first trip home from college. And I looked into those beautiful hazel eyes, they're the same eyes. And she gave me the same hug after church. And everything is right with the world. 
Friends, welcome to our final uh, Sunday, right before All Saints Day. Next Sunday, uh, everything changes in the church. Emily and I have so enjoyed preaching this fall sermon series. It's entitled, Harvesting the Fruits of the Spirit. I believe in your bulletins is printed in Galatians chapter 5, uh, the verse, the magisterial teaching from the Apostle Paul that we have been reflecting on word by word through these fall Sundays. Um, interestingly, uh, the way that Emily laid out the schedule, uh, she saved the first gift for last. And the readings will tell you why. Of course, it's love. Please don't miss the fact that uh, Christians encounter love the way that fish move through water, the way through lungs use air. Um, love and faith are the same very thing. Some people go to church their whole lives have never been told this. Please let me tell you. It's all about the love. I was astonished to note that in the Bible, this word is used 686 times. This word love, both Hebrew and Greek, is used over three times as much as the word that's used next in our list of spiritual fruits. Uh, the word is peace. Love is used over three times in the Bible. The Hebrew word, ahava. Ladies, do you know ahava? Um, an Israeli company had a really smart marketing idea. They went to the edge of the Dead Sea, the lowest place, the Great Rift Valley uh, in Israel, and they scooped up the mud on the banks of the Dead Sea. They put it in a beautiful package, and they sell it to you for a ridiculous amount of money. And it tells you that you're going to look more beautiful after you mud yourself. The name of the company? Ahava. Meaning, if you put mud on your face, you can love yourself. <laughs> it's the same verb. Um, the Greeks, of course, exploring the depth of human experience, one word for love just won't do. The Greeks have five, six different words. The Bible tells us, uh, you say it, uh, we, we're going to say it in just a few minutes. In the Old Testament, God is holy, 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 is the Lord God of hosts. Uh, for our Jewish forebears, God was holy and different and set apart. For Christians, John writes, God is love. And those who love know God and experience God. This is not God with a virtue. This is God's own nature. What did I tell the children? God doesn't know how to love any other way. God is love. Paul is teaching us to be a Christian is to receive God's own nature grafted into us. Um, I tell people that uh, Episcopalians memorize scripture all the time. You're very well acquainted with the Bible, as long as it's the 23rd Psalm or John 3.16. Right? Anybody can remember John 3.16? Can you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know scripture just fine, as long as it's that one verse. Please don't bore me with God being punishing, hectoring, relentless, angry, wrathful, or if you're Anglican, wrathful. That is so shallow. And it's so inadequate. God is love. And when we love, we, we know God. Um, last year, 2016, and by the way, no one that I'm about to mention knows that I'm sharing the story. 2016, April, April or May, Tampa, Florida, my dad's memorial service. 
In the home church where I grew up, we had everything ready. Deacon Steve came to Florida. He served as the deacon of the altar at my dad's memorial service. He brought our plaid Colorado tartan to dress the altar of my home church. We hired, my brother hired the St. Andrew's pipe and drums, because when you say this goodbye to someone who's Scottish, you gotta make a hell of a lot of noise, and we did. We had bagpipes, we had drums, I wore my father's kilt. Um, it was an amazing experience. All six grandchildren together participating in the service. And five minutes before that service, Jessica Tenner, the wife of C.J. Tenner from Benet Vale, walked in from Colorado. I was gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. She was visiting her father in Lake Wales, and she drove to my dad's morning service. Three minutes before the service, I started to choke up seeing Steve there, seeing Jessica there. Three minutes before the service, your ushers, Today, Suzanne and Dick Gilbert walked into the atrium of St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Indiana. They weren't supposed to be there. They're supposed to be here. They only exist here. <laughs> right? I had no idea. They didn't tell me they were coming. And I completely lost it when Dick and Suzanne walked in. I'm surprised I didn't ask them to usher my dad's service. It, it was an amazing gift of love. And I tell you, uh, Steve and Jessica and Dick and Suzanne, they stayed, they listened to all the Scottish music, they stayed at the memorial reception, they listened to all kinds of scurrilous line stories about our family, none of which are true. They were part of our family that day. And it, it was such a beautiful gift, representing your love to our family. Can I tell you that Jesus, when he was asked, out of 413 commandments, that's how many there are in the first century in Jewish tradition, 413 commandments we're supposed to pay attention to every day. Jesus was asked by the lawyer, which one is the most important? Totally trick question. And Jesus responded, What's the first word he uses? You heard it like six minutes ago. What's the first word he said? Can you guess? Not a hard question. <laughs> love. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. Why is it that people in this congregation will go to a Broncos playoff game? We'll, we'll get there in another couple of years. A Broncos playoff game. We'll go to an Avalanche game. We'll go to a New York Yankees game or watch them on TV, and their bodies will lose all control. Their arms will start waving like this. They'll start to talk to the TV as if it can talk back. Their whole body is involved in the moment. Trevor Simeon, figure out zone coverage. You're from Northwestern. It's not too hard. Find your tight end. Everything's good. How come people will do that? Surrounded by thousands of people they've never met. And those same people will walk into this church, sit down, and be quiet as a church mouse. As if God might be offended. Why? Jesus said, love God with everything you got. And love your neighbor just like that too. When Jesus confronted his friend Peter, after Peter threw him under the bus, denied he ever knew him, the night before Jesus is executed, when Jesus is resurrected, he takes a moment with one of his best friends. He asks Peter three questions. The same amount, number of times Peter denied Jesus, Jesus gives him a chance to be redeemed, to be forgiven, and reconciled. Do you remember the question that Jesus asked Peter? near the end of John's Gospel. Thank you, Bob. Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Three times, do you love me? That's why Peter's able to go out and write a letter to 
20, 30 years later. And in that letter, Peter says, you know what kind of church we should be? We should be the kind of church where people look at us and say, look how those Christians love one another. Golden, Colorado. Applewood, if you want to be technical. 1995. It was the beginning of the wars over human sexuality in the Episcopal Church. Our rector, the man that called me to Colorado, I was his young priest in Golden. He had left the church after a year of me being there to take a larger church some, somewhere else. And it was a very hurtful time in the Episcopal Church. People started to break apart when our rector left over how they felt about human sexuality or political positions or how you spoke about scripture. They started to move seats in the congregation on Sunday morning. It was like a high school, a middle school dance. And people started to group together. All of a sudden, people changed their social affiliations. They changed who they golfed with. They started to change who they were inviting to parties. It was terrible. The deacon of our church had traveled, he'd been on sabbatical, he came back. Robert Franken is his name, some of you have met Robert. And Robert said, this is like fathers left the table and the kids are throwing food at each other, except they're adults. Robert came back after sabbatical as the deacon and preached one of the most amazing sermons I've ever heard. And Robert looked at all of these people who he had served for almost 20 years. And he said, I cannot believe that such loving people can act together in such an unloving way. And that deacon took that congregation to the woodshed in that sermon. That was the last sermon that Robert ever preached. He was disinvited from the pulpit after that sermon. That church has gone this to today. Friends, I want to tell you that in the moment when I was hugged by that two-year-old little girl, she never asked me about my political affiliation. She never asked me how I felt about human sexuality. In fact, we've never talked about any of that as she's grown up. What we've experienced is unconditional Christian love. In the past three weeks, within our fellowship, I have heard statements. They're such a completely great person, I don't understand why they support that president. Or, within the same three week period, you know, I love her even though, as a Democrat, she's a moron. like that and I've had that experience myself and I think if we're a church called to hold the heart of a community God calls us to a love that transcends and transforms those places where we get stuck against each other it's not my job to hold the church together it's not Emily's job it's not Steve's job God gives us this gift of divine love opens up his arms wide and says, come on in. I'll love you like no one else has ever loved you before. Kind of like this. Can I tell you that when we gather here like this, I for one, and I've said it before, don't really care about your political affiliation. I could frankly care less. I care about your soul and your life what's going on in your family, in your marriage, in your walk with God. And I will love you. And I hope you will love me too. That we have to act differently now than the world around us. We have to. I want people, when you walk out of this church, when I walk out of this church, I want people to look at our church and say, see how they love 
I don't have a final story for you. Do you know why? We're writing it together right now. The final story of God's love is right here, right now. It's in the mission trips. It's in the youth group. It's in the teachings. It's in the caring for each other pastorally that we do. It's in the worship. It's how we pass the peace. And friends, somebody here in just a moment might get a hug like a two-year-old throwing her arms around someone that they love. Get ready, because I might just hug someone here just like that.